welcome you. Uh, this is our, our our first in a series of four lecture series, and we're putting this together, the School of Arts and Sciences here at Concordia in Mequon and Ann Arbor in conjunction with the Concordia International Center. And so we want to thank our, our international students that are joining us and are going to present tonight. We have an interesting set of panelists that are going to give you a, a view of, um, of different African nations and we hope to provide some nuance and some uh, garner some interest in you so that uh, hopefully you'll, you'll want to uh, look into some of the areas that we're going to speak about or places that we're going to speak about a little bit more uh, as we begin. The, we know that um, international travel is, is restricted right now and so one of the reasons that we're bringing this type of a series to you this semester is one to get a little bit of international perspective and two to highlight some of the uh, some of the faculty that are presenting tonight their disciplines and their connection to uh, different african nations and so we're excited about that and and three we're also extremely excited to welcome uh, our, our two international students who are going to talk a bit of where they are from and, and give us a, a view of you know, uh, where they come from, some of their uh, cultures, customs, what it's like to be a student, an international student here at Concordia, um, why they came here, those types of things. So we're real, real excited to begin. I want to give a heartfelt thanks both to the School of Arts and Sciences and also the International Center for putting this on and welcome uh, to my students and, and to those that are here from other classes, those that are here from Mequon and Ann Arbor, we'll go ahead and get started. So we have a brief, uh, a, a series of brief talks that we are going to hear from. They are roughly 10 minutes long and so our first will come from Dr. John Horgan who is in the Department of History here in Mequon. And Dr. Horgan, you have um, access to screen share, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Actually, I do not. You need to make me Well, oh, you came out and, oh, I'm, I apologize. I forgot you came out and went back in. Yeah, that okay. was me. Okay, I, I updated it now. All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, to Brian for arranging this session. Let me find what I need here. Um, as uh, Professor Gunnison mentioned, uh, I'm Dr. Horgan from the History Department at Concordia, uh, and Africa was, is, remains uh, not only one of my graduate fields, but, but still a place of interest. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say I still have not visited the continent, um, but it's still on my bucket list of things to do. Uh, and when Brian, uh, Professor Gunnison invited me to join in the discussion, um, I asked to go first uh, because I wanted to uh, take a look at a more continent-wide view of Africa uh, and highlight uh, some characteristics uh, of the continent. And of course, this is not easy to do in 10 minutes, uh, but I am determined to do that. Um, but as I've told my students uh, in my Modern Africa course that I'm teaching this semester, uh, this is an impossible task to undertake. Uh, so we'll try and limit ourselves to only that which is possible. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to sort of go around the, the continent using the, the infographic that you see on the, the screen uh, to talk about and hopefully dispel uh, a lot of stereotypes that uh, Westerners, but in particular Americans, have about uh, Africa. I think on the whole, Europeans are generally much better informed uh, and, and much more aware of the situations, the issues, the conditions uh, throughout the continent. Americans, not as much. You, you rarely ever see um, a story appearing in newspapers or, or 
on the news uh, or even in you know general interest magazines about uh, the content unless of course it's something really really bad and, and we always like to you know play up play up disasters uh, here in, in the United States uh, but hopefully I can undercut uh, some of those um, so there are a lot of misconceptions uh, about Africa uh, partly because most often, at least here in the United States, all we ever hear about is its struggles. And, and it does have struggles. Uh, it, it does have food security issues. There are water issues. Uh, there are housing issues, uh, particularly in some of the largest cities uh, that have some of the world's biggest slums. Um, there is remnants of uh, European colonialism that have retarded Africa's uh, growth. Um, but that's not all uh, that Africa is about. And, and, and many of those issues, even the three specific ones on food, water, and housing, you know, those are issues that are, that are common all over the globe. Uh, although it, it always seems, at least in Africa, uh, that the, the issues are, are far more extreme, sometimes much more uh, profound and of course affect many more people because Africa uh, is the second largest continent uh, on the earth behind uh, Asia and it currently has a population of just under 1.4 billion uh, people. Uh, so it's true when something goes wrong or is going wrong in Africa uh, it often affects a lot more people you know, that if it's the same sort of issue that might confront the United States or might confront China or, or another another country like that. Um, uh, but the continent is, is much more than just some of those stereotypes. Um, and, and I hate to say this, uh, and, and it's going to make P Professor Gunderson shake. Uh, it will certainly make the African students shake a little, but I find myself having to say it every semester when I teach the course. And, and since I know much of the audience here is, you know, an American audience, the most important thing you have to know and bear in mind at all times um, is that Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent and it is comprised of 54 independent nation states uh, there's a couple of independent homelands in the country of south africa uh, and the the newest member to the nation state club uh, on the continent is the south sudan uh, that gained its independence a, a few years ago from the Sudan after a, a terribly horrible civil war uh, between North and South for religious and economic uh, reasons, right? Um, and it's really big. Africa is huge. Uh, and I like the little map here uh, up here on the left uh, because it shows you uh, what other countries you could squeeze onto the continent, right? Including China, the United States, India, Japan, and most of Europe, right? Um, according to studies uh, that screen DNA markers, and here we're talking about some of the genetic diversity, not just on the continent, but around the world, uh, the African continent has the highest level of genetic diversity uh, in the world. Uh, and according to some researchers, this makes sense uh, because it's believed uh, that this is where uh, the human race uh, first arose and then spread out uh, all, over the, all over the world. And, and as I mentioned to uh, the students in my Modern Africa class, and, and we'll get to that in a, in a couple of days next week when we look at uh, ethnic uh, ethnic groups uh, throughout the continent. Um, uh, 
it, it is a place of diverse peoples. Um, and, and if you're only looking at skin color, which sometimes we do, uh, all shades, all types of skin can be found throughout the continent. Um, Africa is also probably one of the most, if not the most, multilingual of all of the continents of the world. Uh, Arabic is the most widely spoken language, um, uh, but it's also home to over 2,000 other languages. Uh, and just as a sort of couple of points of, of reference, uh, Nigeria and Cameroon here in West Africa uh, have more than 500 spoken languages. That's just in Nigeria. And there's 200 spoken languages in Cameroon. Uh, in Nigeria, English is the official language, uh, although you will find people speaking Hausa and Yoruba and Igbo, those are three of the biggest ethnic groups uh, in that country. Uh, and they are just as commonly spoken as English is. Uh, in Cameroon, uh, French, English, and German uh, have all been official languages at one time in the country. But if you ever get a chance to visit, uh, you're also likely to hear Fofaide, Iwando, or Frangolais. Frangolais, which is some fractured combination of French and, French and English. Uh, down in the south of the continent in South Africa, uh, that country has 11 official languages. And when we talk about official languages from a nation state perspective, what that generally means is that at least all government documents are usually published in all of the official languages. So imagine 11 of them. Uh, and they include uh, Zulu, Hosa, Afrikaans, uh, which is sort of a bastardized form of Dutch. Uh, the Dutch were some of the original uh, European settlers uh, in, in Southern Africa. Uh, and they also speak uh, English as, as well. In terms of religion, uh, Islam is the dominant religion in Africa. Christianity is second. Uh, you find most of the Islamic countries uh, in the northern part of the continent, uh, especially grouped around the Sahara, uh, but also uh, coming down the, the east coast. Uh, Christianity is much more prevalent uh, in the middle part uh, of the continent and, and toward the south. Um, and that's largely just based on uh, the groups of people who came into Africa hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, by 2050, by 2050, there are some projections that nearly 40% of all Christians in the world will live in sub-Saharan Africa. When, when people think of Africa, they probably think of the savannas, right? Those are the low grasslands. Uh, anybody who's ever watched a National Geographic special on Africa, uh, they always show you the animals and they always show you the migration of animals. Uh, and those are the animals that, that literally cross the continent east to west, sometimes north to south, uh, across those uh, grasslands which you find usually attached um, uh, pretty close to the edges of, of the desert or uh, the big uh, rainforest here in the central and western portions of, of, of the continent. Um, but Africa also has mountain ranges, right? They have shrublands, uh, they have great coastlines around the entirety of the, the continent, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, uh, the Mediterranean Sea here in the in the north. Uh, they do have a set of Great Lakes, 
that you find here in this area of the continent uh, includes Lake Victoria and Lake Tanganyika. Um, and they're oftentimes referred to as the Great Lakes uh, of the continent. Um, another stereotype to be dispelled is a long-standing stereotype about what the average African looks like. Uh, and this we get from all those horribly old movies, especially the Tarzan movies of, you know, African peoples, uh, uh, you know, running around in grass skirts or, or something similar to that. Um, but actually 37% of Africans today in on the continent live in urban areas. Um, and over the next 30 years, Africa will be the fastest urbanizing region in the world. But that's going to come with lots of difficulties, especially keeping up with housing and infrastructure, utilities, uh, etc. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges uh, ahead um, uh, for Africa's urban area. Um, the United Nations projects that uh, Africa will be home to nearly 40% of the world's population, uh, pretty much comparable to Asia. Uh, the same report predicts that by 2100, 2100, a mere 79 years away, right? Uh, that half of the world's most populous countries will be found in Africa. Uh, right now, only Nigeria is on the, the top 10 list of populous uh, countries. Uh, but the birth rates in Africa as a whole are, are pretty uh, phenomenal. And they are, they certainly eclipse the birth rates both in Europe uh, as well as in North America, both Canada uh, and uh, the United States. Poverty, of course, is an issue, right? Uh, and it's always an issue with that many people uh, in a region of the world where uh, supplies are sometimes short, uh, revenues are always lacking, um, but many African economies are making rapid progress. Since this newest era of globalization, uh, we've seen the rate of poverty and the number of impoverished people on the continent uh, drop substantially, in some cases, almost by half. Um, but African countries right now, uh, five or six of them, um, uh, are in the top 10 of the fastest growing economies around the world. Uh, and that includes Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, uh, Ethiopia's here, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast uh, over here in, in, in the West. Right? And then finally, because I promised I would keep to my tent, um, uh, in my Africa course this semester, uh, I, I spend a lot of time uh, beginning about halfway through the course when we really do a deep dive uh, into the culture of Africa. There, there's a, and, and I'm gonna plug a video series uh, it was made by uh, Nature and the folks at National Geographic. Uh, it's, a, it's an eight-part series, and, and they go around to the different areas of the continent. Uh, each episode of roughly 50 minutes tells the story of two different people or groups of people. Uh, of course, there's also a little bit of time devoted to the animals because it wouldn't be nature series or National Geographic without animals involved. Um, uh, but you learn a lot of really interesting and fascinating uh, uh, cultural uh, moments uh, that get no headlines and get no news. Uh, the one that uh, I always remember and impressed me the most is the uh, initiation rites of a, of a 12 year old little boy who goes on his first salt caravan uh, at the, the, the Sahara. Um, but there's all kinds of really interesting uh, stories that play out in that uh, series. And, and along with the series, uh, I always take time to talk 
with the students about the issues uh, of water and food and housing. Uh, health security has become a, a really big issue uh, throughout the continent. Um, uh, economy, of course, uh, one of the uh, most recent interesting developments in, in economy uh, and economics across the continent uh, is the investments by China in building infrastructure and businesses uh, around uh, Africa. Uh, we also look at conflict minerals, uh, not just diamonds, which was the original conflict, but also a mineral called coltran. C-O-L-T-R-A-N. Uh, the largest reserve of it in the world is located here in the northern area of the Congo. Uh, it's a conflict-ridden zone, um, but it's an important mineral uh, because without it, cell phones wouldn't work, laptops wouldn't work, computers wouldn't work, um, satellites in space would not work. Uh, and the biggest deposit is found in the heart of Africa. Uh, and it's always being contested by a variety of, of groups, both aligned with nations on the border of Congo as well as inside the Congo. Um, Africa has a very active social media uh, life. Um, and one of the uh, interesting stories uh, that I relate to them is uh, in those parts of the continent where uh, electricity is sometimes an issue. Uh, a couple of guys who developed a, a little device that you attach to a bicycle wheel and you can put your cell phone in it uh, and then pedal the bike around in order to charge the cell phone. It's extremely clever, right? Uh, and it came out of a couple of, you know, need from a couple of guys uh, in, in Africa. And of course, I always talk about the wildlife, both the, the large reserves throughout the continent to protect the wildlife from, from poachers, um, uh, as well as the bushmeat phenomena, Africans who are uh, eating uh, some of the native native animals because they just simply don't have food available to them uh, otherwise. Um, uh, and, and it would be remiss of me to spend a semester looking at the African continent and not talking about the animals. So we always end the semester uh, by watching a, a, a long documentary uh, uh, called Virunga. Uh, it's available only on Netflix. Uh, but it talks about the uh, the trials and tribulations of the park rangers uh, in an African national park, a reserve park here in South Africa. Um, so there's a lot to know. There's a lot to see. There's a lot to appreciate about the world's second largest continent. Thank you, Dr. Horgan. You. If you wouldn't mind, if you could share those resources, the titles of those in the chat, we'd appreciate it as, as our, I introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much for presenting. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Uh, Suleiman, too, uh, one of our, our student presenters, Aisha Suleiman, uh, who is a biomedical science major, is on the pre-medicine track, and we're excited to, to hear from you. Aisha, uh, the floor is yours, and you have access to the screen share if you need. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aisha Suleiman. I'm from Nigeria, and 22 years old, a major in biomedical science in the pre-med track. So one of the reasons why I choose my major was, um, I've always wanted to be a medical doctor, probably a surgeon. And like, the main reason why I choose it was because I knew that I wanted to leave my purpose. Like, why am I here? What is my job on earth? What do I have to do to feel like, okay, I'm doing what I'm meant to do. So I just know that being a surgeon is me leaving my purpose. 
serving others i've always wanted to serve others like okay i have to serve people and yeah just wanted to be a surgeon to help people and it also has quite a few things to do with where i come from nigeria like none of my family is sick for me it's like okay I'm, that's why i'm going into medicine you know nobody was sick i just other than giving money to people other than okay i can assist you with money and this and that i want to go beyond that level i want to be there all the way so like i want to be a surgeon so that's why i'm always on program um and the difference between the united states and nigeria there's a huge difference between well yeah there is a, a huge difference too because i was i was 16 years old when i left nigeria to live in mexico and then the us so it's like this transition up the way there is a difference between nigeria mexico and then united states i was able to like just witness the three countries why is this different why is my country like that why is this country this way and why is the united states this way and i've come to the conclusion that the way of life of an individual impacts the country one way or the other like down the line or up the trend it goes down to the way the country is going to represent itself at the end of the day in nigeria we are underdeveloped yes but i know that the citizens in nigeria are hard working they try all their very best to make sure that they're successful the government is just the way it is we have to live by it and just accept it and spending about six years in mexico it was different it was really different it was different in the fact that no matter how many years i spent in mexico i just knew that nigeria would have done better if you have the better government, if you have the electricity, everything these people have, Nigeria is going to be a better country. I know it. And then moving to the United States for over a year now, there is quite a number of difference. There is like a huge difference between Mexico itself and the United States. There is the vast difference. The citizens, the way the students want to go to school, for the better life yeah there's quite a huge difference and that's why my major keeps pushing me motivating me that i have to be a soldier and i have to go back to my homeland i have to do something for these people not just my country other countries in africa as well they need better healthcare system other like hates to help students young children fulfill their dream regardless of if their government the, the government is lacking behind in that aspect yeah, that's one of the reasons. And the third one was what growing up in Nigeria was like. Um, I'm sort of an introvert. I don't really go out, so I, I didn't really have the time to really know what goes on in Nigeria. My dad is a soldier and we live in the military cantonment. So like, I'm not always outside, just my home and school. But the little that I know, Nigeria can be a scary place overall. Like I feel like I feel like I feel more safe in the United States, Mexico than home. Like when I tell my mom that I want to come back home and this and that is like, I think you should still stay put there. So I feel like Nigeria is a scary place, but at the same time, going like being in Nigeria motivates you to to do to do better. The the citizens, the students, the people. They are always on their feet working nine to five for a better life. So like being in Nigeria, it's just like, like there's no day, no time. The street is always busy. People are always out there on the go for a better life. And I'm grateful for that. Grateful for that. Grateful I think of it. Thank you.
Thank you, AJ. That was wonderful. I appreciate uh, you presenting, and it was it was uh, beautiful to hear your story. I know there will be uh, some questions that that uh, the attendees will want to ask you. As as you're listening, jot down your questions because we we should have a, a short period at the end where we can ask some questions as well as for Dr. Horgan. We're going to continue with the the presentations. I will want to to present. Reverend Dr. Ron Mudge, uh, he is from the Department of Theology, and he and his wife Lisa served as missionaries in the French-speaking West African countries of Ivory Coast and Togo from 1997 to 2006. Uh, while teaching theology in informal settings and at a seminary, Dr. Mudge used biblical teaching to engage in differences between African and American cultures. They'll speak on the intersection of theology and life in the Ivory Coast and Togo, focusing on cultures that stress faithfulness to the group. And with this in mind, you will highlight social obligations, shame culture, the role of spirits, respect for the elderly, elderly, forgive me, and polygamy. So Dr. Reverend Dr. Mudge, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to follow up uh, a little bit on what Dr. Horgan had to say, he mentioned that, that uh, Christianity is big in, in, or, sorry, in Africa and uh, and growing and that that's uh, I'm, I'm i'm i was involved i guess on the business side of that <laughs> as the, the church is growing more and more uh they're interested in studying theology studying the bible uh developing uh local leadership to be to be pastors uh, and uh and leaders in the in the church and that's what my role was um, just to, to give one uh relatively impressive example uh, the church Makani Jesus in Ethiopia is a church of more than 10 million members. So we've got some big, big churches in Africa. Uh, I worked in French speaking countries, Ivory Coast and Togo. And uh, I worked most closely with the Gere people in Ivory Coast. Um, I learned the language well enough to converse. It's, it's a challenging language, but um, did learn the language and the, the culture of people. And, and uh, and in my role teaching theology and doing a lot of learning of, of culture and interacting with God's word, um, I, I, uh, I found that I, I would sometimes think of it as maybe a triangle. If you think of three places, one place is Africa, or let's say Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast, Gary culture. We can compare that to American culture, and then we can compare that to the different biblical cultures that we see. And that can really be quite enlightening. So one of the things I, I want to talk about is uh, cultures that stress faithfulness to a group. Uh, that's different in many cases from the way Americans do things. Uh, we tend to be much more individualistic with the idea of we, we want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make for ourselves and, and that sort of thing. And perhaps uh, an example of that, that, that drives the point home is social security. Uh, in, in America, if you pay into social security, when it comes time to retire, social security will pay back to you. And so in a sense, uh, your younger self is caring for your older self. And uh, you've managed to take care of yourself even when you're, when you're old and not working anymore and you don't need anybody. Um, in the, the Gary culture, and, and I, I'll talk most specifically about them because I know them best I imagine this applies in other other settings as well. But in, in the Gary culture, uh, there is no social security. We talked a little bit about some of the poverty issues. Um, there, there's really nothing like that to speak of. So uh, what happens if you, if you get sick? You don't have some insurance to help you. What happens when you get old? You don't have secure, social security to help you. So in um, among the Gary people, it's, it's done by relationships. Uh, at the family level, relatively large families, at the extended family level, clans and tribes uh, of people caring for each other. And um, so, the, so the idea is, uh, I guess if I, could, if I could bring it down to a, an assumption, the assumption is human beings need each other. And so if you have the opportunity to help someone, you help, trusting that you're probably going to need help from them at some point in life and they will be able to help you as well. And with that in mind, I, I saw some, some amazing kindnesses. Uh, I was in a, a city once 
where a taxi driver was going up a hill and this car stalled and um, he started coasting back down the hill. <laughs> and a bunch of men from the, this is just the sides of the road, they didn't know him at all, but they grabbed him and pushed him up, pushed his vehicle up to the top of the hill so he could get to safety. Um, I was often lost. I traveled a lot and I was trying to find places. And I don't know how often a stranger would uh, hop in the vehicle with me and, and direct me to the place where I wanted wanted to go. Um, when I would, uh, I would travel with African friends, wherever we would go, they would be building networks, getting to know people, uh, giving small gifts, helping each other out. And that's all part of the bigger picture of people need each other. <clears throat> and the way that it works out in, in a family, especially, is if someone gets sick, everyone in the family pitches in. When uh, someone's too old to, to work in, in a productive way where they're, they're bringing food or money into the family, the family cares for them. Well, how does this relate to the Bible? Uh, I think we have some individuality and uh, quite a bit uh, of this uh, faithfulness to the group in the Bible as well, especially in the Old Testament. If you think of Abraham, uh, Abraham, if he had trouble, he couldn't call the police. There were no police. He couldn't call in the, the military. There was no there was no military. It was his extended family. And um, so with the extended family, they, they cared for each other. And if they needed to, to basically engage in a police action or a military action, they, they did that. Um, so, so really the organization of family and then ultimately tribes and, and even the people of Israel uh, was built in to, to great extents in the same sort of way that I, I saw among the, the Gary people. Um, in a situation like this, social obligations are very important. How do you organize a society? How do you make it work? Um, people need to respect everyone in the family, know how authority works in the family, and do their part. And so, again, to, to, to distinguish a little bit from American culture, in many cases, uh, families in America will often have this idea of independence, um, where a parent or parents would say to the child, you can do whatever you want, just tell us what you'd like to do and we'll try to, to make that happen. There's a, a similar attitude among the Gary people, but it's in the bigger picture of um, how can we make things work out well for our family overall? So there are conversations where um, the family can't afford to send everybody to school through high school sometimes or into college sometimes. And so the, the, um, the leader of the family interacting with the rest of the family decides who will play which roles. Uh, some, they might say uh, there's a there's a daughter who's especially smart and she's doing well in school, so let's help her to continue. Maybe there's another daughter who's more gifted uh, at, at sewing, so we try to help her to, to get um, an opportunity to, to grow in that, do some sort of an internship and develop uh, um, her own business. And, and so the family's all working together for that. And each member is, is taught as they, they grow up to, to pride themselves in caring for their family. If you, if you want to try to decode a culture, a good place to start is by asking, how do you know a person is a good person? <laughs> and so among the Gary people, it's someone who, who does right by their family, who does what, what they're supposed to, to, to relate well to their family. On the other side of that, um, shame is, is the negative side. It's, it's when things don't happen the way they're supposed to. Uh, as Americans, I think we tend to, to think of, of shame as more an emotion, something that, you know, something happened and, and it made you feel bad, and it's usually a pretty bad thing. Um, where, the, where, where the society is organized in, in a way where people are caring for each other in, in groups, uh, shame is, is a means of social control. So if someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then the family shuns them. And to compare it to America, that's like saying, you can't have social security. <laughs> you can't have insurance. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a, a fair amount of what power behind that idea. Uh, if a person does something that brings shame upon them, they want to resolve that so they can be part of the family again and have support of the family. Um, another interesting aspect of, of African culture is an understanding of, of spirits. Um, the, the Gary people believe 
that uh, there are there are all kinds of spirits in the world. I think uh, most Americans would maybe refer to angels or angels and demons. Um, but for the most part, I think in America, people either don't believe in angels and demons or don't really believe in the sense that they might actually do something. Um, but in Africa, there is this this thought that there are um, there are many powers, there are spiritual forces at work. And uh, as you read through the Bible, <laughs> the African view certainly seems to, to fit the biblical view um, quite well, where we see quite a bit of talk about, again, angels, demons, spirits that are, uh, that are active. Uh, coming back to talk about family organization, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of the elderly. I think in, in America, perhaps we are, it's because we're success driven, perhaps. But there's a point where our, our grandparents are no longer really getting it done at work. <laughs> Maybe retired, doing their own thing, and we love them and we care about them, but, but they, they end up being uh, kind of off to the side and things. Whereas in Africa, uh, in, in uh, the Gary culture especially, um, the, uh, the, the Gary people would have what they call the bull, and the bull is the, the oldest male in the extended family. I actually am the bow of my family right now. <laughs> um, but it's the oldest living living male, and, and he's he, he has leadership in the family uh, as long as his mind is still functioning well. And um, maybe a comparison, if you've seen one of the Godfather movies without all the violence, but, but, but going to the Godfather, having conversations, getting things figured out. Uh, how are we gonna work this out? How are we gonna do things? Because, um, in, especially in these sort of social settings, uh, an elder knows an awful lot. They're very wise. They know how to manage people. They know how to make good decisions. And that's key to family leadership. And uh, that's another place where uh, we see quite a bit of, uh, of that in the Old Testament especially as well, where the, the, the elder Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, the family turns to them. The family respects them throughout. And um, let me end on, on kind of a... Um, I don't know, maybe controversial note and talk a little bit about polygamy. Um, uh, for the most part, American tradition is not polygamy. Uh, one, uh, just, just two people mar married at, at one time. But uh, in some places uh, among the Gary people, polygamy is still practiced. And you can see a little bit of that um, from the whole idea of the, the social. Um, the, the Gary people don't find a lot of wealth in paper money they find wealth in human beings. So uh, a man would think, uh, the more wives I have, the more children I can, I can have, the more uh, work we can do, farming, businesses, the wealthier I will be. And so there's, there's value in that. Um, I think Americans might react initially at least to say, well, at least that's not the way we do it around here. <laughs> but again, uh, if you read in the Old Testament, very clearly, uh, there were there were leaders who practiced polygamy uh, in, in a way somewhat similar to what we see in Africa. And there's in, even an interesting, and for my work, an important note in the New Testament uh, that uh, uh, if, a, if a man has more than one wife, uh, he should not be a, an elder or a pastor. But that's really the only limitation. Uh, in Among mission work, I've, I've heard of cases where people have uh, encouraged a man who becomes Christian to divorce his wives. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us we're supposed to divorce anybody either. And, and that often will put the, the wife in a very difficult uh, social and financial situation. So uh, again, one more point where we find uh, some connection between uh, the Old Testament especially and Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mudd. Great job. Thank you, uh, everyone so far. It's been wonderful. I, I appreciate your participation in, in your presentation. We'll move now to um, student Abigail Tades, who is going to speak to us about her home country of Ethiopia. She's another of our international students here at Concordia. Abigail, you have the floor and you have access to the, the screen share if you'd like. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Um, let me share my screen here. Can you guys see it? We can see it. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so um, my presentation today is about Ethiopia. I titled it Unique Ethiopia because from um, my conversation, you'll get to find so many like interesting facts about Ethiopia. Um, so to start with um, like some historical facts about Ethiopia, um, it is like one of the oldest like countries in the world. It is contemporary to ancient Egypt and the earliest known kingdom in Ethiopia is called Damat. Um, it, and in Ethiopia, um, legends tell that Queen of Sheba um, was like from Ethiopia. If you guys uh, know anything about her, she was a queen that came to King Solomon and um, she brought a lot of gifts and with her and we uh, Ethiopians believe that when she went back to Ethiopia, she was pregnant with a child named Minilik. So after her her son was born, we um, like Ethiopian kings like tried to sometimes trace their lineage back to King Min, uh, King Minilik, and they would say that they have the Solomonic lineage. Um, another fact about Ethiopia is Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that has never been colonized. Ethiopians take a huge pride in that. Um, the Italians came for like 40 years and tried to colonize the country, but um, the people were not willing to be colonized and they fought back. So it remained to be the only country in Africa that was never colonized. So this picture you see on here is uh, from a church called Aksu. It is believed to be the final resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, no one is allowed to see the Ark except for a sole guardian that has been appointed. Um, even the leaders of the Ethiopian um, Orthodox Church, which is the prominent denomination in Ethiopia, they're not allowed to go see the Ark of the Covenant as it is believed to be very sacred. And this person uh, who's appointed to guard this uh, art, to guard the Ark of the Covenant stays within that place until his death. Now to some fun facts about Ethiopia. The picture you see on the left is a rock Hewan church that was craved from a single chunk of rock. The church have no bricks and no blocks and no evidence of joints. Instead, they carved out a single solid chunk of uh, pink volcanic rock that underlay the region's hillsides. This was built in the 13th century by the order of King Lalibela. He reportedly ordered the construction after he visited Jerusalem in 1087 BC. It is one of the um, UNESCO's heritage sites. And the picture you see on your right is remain fossils of uh, Lucy. It, she is believed to be the um, oldest human. I say this in quotation because here at Concordia, we don't believe in evolution, but that's uh, just a cool fact. Um, and she was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. So this picture here says 13 months of sunshine. Um, Ethiopia has 13 months. So we have 12 months of 30 days and the remaining five or six days is categorized by its own and it's given in like an extra month. Another interesting thing about Ethiopia is it is the only country to use a 12 hour clock counting from dawn to, from dawn to dusk um, from dawn to dusk and 7 a.m in Ethiopia corresponds to one o'clock so the first daylight hour and then second daylight hour third daylight hour and then midday would be the sixth daylight hour so it's very confusing for like foreigners when they come to Ethiopia like for instance right now it is 7 30 p.m. In Ethiopia, we would say it is 
one uh, 150 because it's the um, first hour of the night so it that's another fun fact and then um the next thing here is i put a like a few pictures up here to talk about just our culture we have a very rich culture the picture here on the right on the top left you see is coffee beans um, I will show a very short uh, video later on to talk about like co coffee and the ceremony in Ethiopia. And then this is like our traditional food here. It's very colorful. We eat um, a, a bread called injera, which is kind of like a sourdough bread and very delicious. Um, we a bit like during New Year's, then New Year's Eve, we have a bonfire, like family comes together and we celebrate bon like with a bonfire, which is a really um, great time like for family bonds and things like that. And then that's the, an Ethiopian bread. It's just this giant bread we cut during like special holidays and special occasions. So here it's a picture of like a bride and a groom. I put it up here because weddings are very big celebration in Ethiopia. It's not just two people getting married. It's like this family coming together, but everybody gets invited. Like weddings are, there's like 400, 500 weddings. Like a uh, in, invitation is very common and it's not even considered a big wedding. So I grew up going to weddings like almost every other week. So um, that's another fun fact. So this is the Ethiopian alphabet you see here. We, um, Ethiopia, because it was never colonized, was able to maintain its own alphabet and own language. And it's the only country in Africa that has its own um, alphabet. This is a picture of a church called Medhani Alem in the capital uh, Addis. It's a, a very big church and I put it up here to also talk about Christianity. Christianity is like one of the biggest um, like religion in Ethiopia and specifically the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is very influential. Um, this is the picture of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. You would see a lot of pictures like this if you go to Eth an, an Ethiopian church uh, pictures like this are like all over and these are like hand-painted pictures on the wall so you would see so this is a picture taken at night uh, the night of before easter people go to church and we wear like white um, linen cloth and just it's a very special holiday like easter is the biggest holiday for ethiopians specifically for christians too but it's um it's a very big celebration. So I have this short video, if it's okay with time, I'll show it, um, it's just a minute. It talks about coffee and the origin of coffee in Ethiopia. Legend has it that sometime around 800 AD, an Ethiopian goat herder named Kaldi noticed his herd eating the cherries from some small trees. The goats quickly became excited and began to frolic with energy. Curious, called the ate one of the cherries and noticed the surprising effect. He cut a branch from the tree and took it to a local monastery. A monk put the branch in a pot and boiled it. The monk tried the brew and found it bitter, so he threw the branch in a fire. Soon, to his surprise, he was surrounded by one of the most beautiful fragrances he had ever smelled. Ah, the delicious secret was in roasting the beans. <laughs> This is just a little story behind and there's another video also like one minute long that talks about just the Ethiopian coffee ceremony because this is a very big um, thing in Ethiopia. All Ethiopians are proud of their coffee. We usually make coffee ceremonies three times a day. The main reason why we do the coffee ceremony is to social with our friends or family. It is the most important hospitality. I've been making coffee since I was 12 years old. 
first you have to wash the green beans and then we roast it and after we're done roasting it we walk around to let other people smell the smoke Jebana, it's made of a clay, it has a long head. It helps us to brew coffee. Uh, you don't actually need a filter, you just mix the coffee, grind with water, and you brew it in there. I never cared growing up, but now it's just the fact that I gather people and story that people shared while I'm doing the coffee ceremony it has something meaningful. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Abby. Great job. Well, I, I want to thank all of the presenters. I, I was going to present as well, but uh, the, the presentations were so fascinating. I, and, and thank you again to all of those on the panel. I want to uh, conclude. I, if you have an interest in Equatorial Guinea, uh, which is the, the country I was going to present on, tied directly to uh, to Spain and in Latin America and to uh, Spanish speaking nations. I'd be happy to record the video and share it with you, but I want to leave time for, for questions. So uh, it, it just in closing, I will, I will say it's our sincere hope that you've heard something tonight that has piqued your interest. It's made you want to uh, perhaps take a course here at Concordia uh, that uh, you, you heard about uh, or reference to, or to pick up a book uh, that will allow you to uh, learn more about the incredible diversity that exists within the African continent. So uh, before we take questions, just one quick plug for next month, uh, Wednesday the 24th at 7 p.m. We will have a similar night with a, 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 some of the same and some different uh, panelists on Latin America. And so uh, if you have an interest in coming to that, it will be the same Zoom link. I'll, I'll publicize it the same way we did with this one and reach out to students, faculty, and staff. Also, um, if you're interested in presenting, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk with you about that possibility. So with that, I, again, thank you to the presenters. Uh, if you have a question, if you want to put it in the uh, chat, or if you want to raise your hand or, or simply um, unmute and we'll, we'll take a question or two. Yeah, I, don't. I, have a, I have a question for our uh, presenters this evening, um, specifically our international students. What is one food that you loved from your home country that you cannot find here in the U.S.? I love Kutfo, but I can find it here, like if you go to an Ethiopian restaurant. I, I mean, most of the things like the spices are different. So I have to bring it from like my country or I have to have my mom send it to me. But if I go to an Ethiopian restaurant too, I can always find it there. Thank you for asking. There is also one meal my mom, I don't know if any other mom makes it, but I'm a mom makes it and I try to find it here in Canada. No way to be found. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, Aisha, if I can ask you one, one uh, question, just because my wife is from Mexico as well. I'm just curious, where in Mexico did you live? Mexico City. In Mexico City. Okay, very close. And um, she's from, my wife is from Querétaro, so we go oh. as often as we can. So uh, within about two, three hour ride from where, where you live. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's fun. Great. Well, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, thanks to the to the panelists. Thank you again for presenting. Uh, we will stop the recording here. Uh, and I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you all to the attendees for coming. And it, it was a lot of fun, very informative. I think we all learned a lot. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Take care.